Good morning and welcome to Compass. My name is Sarah and it's my pleasure to share with you what's happening around Compass. We're so excited for our Sunday service next week where our Orangeville, Shelburne and Grand Valley sites will be gathering together here in Orangeville for our Church on the Lawn service. Bring a lawn chair, blanket or a few to share and invite your friends. The service starts at 10 a.m. but you'll want to make sure you come early for some pre-service fun. We'll have some goodies and desserts for after the service and a dunk tank. This will help raise funds for our newcomers ministry. Do you have a favorite staff member you're hoping to see get a little bit wet? Maybe get Andy's beard a little bit less perfect looking? Well, come on out and check out who will be on the list for our dunk tank. Our newcomer settlement team is committed to supporting refugees we have sponsored to begin a new life in Canada. This is a tangible example of how Compass is seeking to be known by love in our community. We are thrilled to share that we are preparing to welcome a new family comprising of a mother, father and four children to Canada soon. As Morham and his family will be arriving between September 10th and October 15th. This will provide new opportunities to volunteer as we come alongside this family and help them settle into their new life in our community. You can also give financially towards our designated refugee fund through your offering or by giving online through our website. The amount required for startup costs for this family is $51,665. Through previous giving and our forward financial challenge, the fund currently sits at a balance of $36,500. The most urgent need is for affordable rental housing, preferably a two to three bedroom in the community. To find out more about how you can contribute, please contact the church office. Please keep our student and adult missions teams in your prayers. Our students left this past Friday for the Dominican Republic, where they will be serving with the Lighthouse Project. Our adult team is in Uganda, where Pastor Andrew is preaching this morning in a church in Echole Quarter, a poverty-stricken community in Kampala. Our team will participate this week in the relocation of a family who presently lives in the slums to their new home located in a northern village. As we prepare for the launch of our ministry year, there is a great need for people to step up and volunteer across our sites. As we grow as a church, we need to grow our volunteer teams. There are opportunities for additional people to serve during the week and on Sundays in connections and hospitality, Compass Kids, Compass Students, and in group life. Maybe you have recently joined our church community. This is a great time to get more involved. Perhaps you've served in the past and taken a break. Now is the time to re-engage. If Compass is your church, pray and find out how you can contribute. To sign up, visit our website, thisiscompass.com teams. Fill out an online commitment card or contact the office. This is the best time to jump in and commit to helping your church community. Praying you are blessed by the service this morning. I'm glad you're here. what the hardest thing that you will ever wait for is? Whatever you're waiting for right now. <laughs> it's true. You may be praying and waiting on God for any number of things at this moment. 
Maybe you're waiting to move into your dream house for the pregnancy test that is finally positive, the relationship that might one day lead to marriage, the phone call that you got the job, to be debt-free, the answered prayer for a loved one to come back to God, the healing of your marriage, or physical healing. Well, this list is far than exhaustive. There are so many things that we will find ourselves waiting for over the expanse of a lifetime. Waiting is hard because it involves two things that we cannot control, the timing of our wait and the outcome of our wait. But do you know what you can control? How you wait and who you become through your wait. The Bible is full of instances of people waiting. Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years for the birth of Isaac. The Israelites waited 40 years to enter the promised land. Job waited on God through his suffering. Jacob had to wait seven years for Rachel. Well, technically 14, thanks to a really greedy father-in-law. Hannah, Rachel, and Leah were barren and waited for children. Ruth waited for a husband. The paralytic mentioned in John 5 waited 38 years to pick up his mat and walk. And even Jesus had to wait 30 years before he would begin his ministry. Well, this summer, as we open different invitation each week, we can know that if God is inviting us into something, that it's because he loves us and he wants what's best for us. This morning, his invitation is, will you choose to wait with me? Now, I've waited for many things and continue to wait for others. And if I'm completely honest, I don't always wait patiently or that well. I have waited for test results to see if I had miscarried. I have waited outside the operating room to find out if my 14-year-old had cancer. They did not. I have waited for income and a job when my husband was in between jobs and out of work for almost a year. Well, currently, I am waiting for a call back from a surgeon, my prayers to be answered for healing, and to be pain-free. I am waiting for dreams and desires that are in my heart but have not yet come to pass. Waiting can make the soul weary. Waiting can be exhausting, especially when you don't know how long your wait is going to be. It's like when the power goes out. If the app says two hours, you think, no problem, let's get some candles, we're going to make the best of this. But in the middle of winter, when the app says unknown time until power restoration, something switches in our brains, and we think, I cannot live like a pioneer, we are all doomed. <laughs> We don't like open-ended waits, and we do not like we don't know the outcome because we love control. Now, I believe there is a right way to wait for things that are important to us, a way to position ourselves to learn, develop patience and endurance, and take on a posture where we can grow closer to God. So as you sit here today in God's waiting room, what are you waiting for? As you reflect on your wait, ask yourself, have I been waiting well? You may be thinking as you reflect that you've been impatient with God and others, angry and frustrated because you see no change in your situation or your circumstance. You found that instead of moving closer to God in your wait, you've actually been drifting further away. That instead of waiting on God's sovereign plan, you've been trying to make things happen in your own strength and in your own timing. If that's you, you are not alone. Waiting is so hard, but there is hope. I am living proof. <laughs> well, two years ago, at the beginning of my most recent wait season, after a back injury, I found myself sitting back and passively waiting for things to just get better. At the beginning of my journey, I was in excruciating pain with a collapsed disc and a pinched nerve, and I was just trying to survive. I thought that once God healed me, I would just get back on with life again. I just longed for things to get back to normal. But after a while, I realized that my plan just wasn't working. I was finding myself envious of everyone who was physically active. I felt lonely and isolated and left behind. That the rest of the world was moving on, and I couldn't walk, sit, or stand without being in pain. I would look down at my lame foot that was numb with very little feeling, and tears would begin to well up in my eyes. See, I started to feel sorry for myself when I thought about all the things I just couldn't do anymore. 
I started to focus on what I didn't have rather than all the blessings that I did have. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This verse helped me to put things into perspective when my circumstances just didn't make sense. I needed to shift my thinking to ask God to help me to desire what he desires, trusting that his ways really were best. I have learned that I can trust God's perfect timing because he is the one who created time and he stands outside of time for eternity. Well, one of the verses that's been key in my own personal weight, when things don't seem to be happening as fast as I like or the way I would like, is Romans 8, 28. And I'm going to ask if we could say that together this morning. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. All things. The good things, the hard things, the things that we never asked for and the places that we never wanted to be. God is always at work. See, this verse brings hope to very dark places. When everything seems to be falling apart, God is somehow taking all of our painful pieces and working them together for our good and for his glory. The majority of the time, he is at work behind the scenes. And do you know why that is? Because that is what builds our faith. Waiting in expectancy rather than expectation is the first way that we can wait well. I want you to picture two lines. One is for a roller coaster or your favorite restaurant or a band you really want to see, and the other is for the DMV to get your license renewed. Both lines are going to be a one-hour wait. The first line, you are waiting in expectancy that something good is about to happen. The other one, not so much. When it comes to our current wait, we need to move from a place of expecting something from God to waiting in expectancy for what God wants to do. When we wait with this posture, even in the rare instances when God says no, we can be confident he is only saying no because he has something way better in store for us or he is protecting us. If we choose to surrender our desires to his perfect will, it allows him to work in our lives. Tim Keller said, in short, God will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything that he knew. Brian Wardlaw, one of our Brazilian missionaries here from Compass, sent out an email a few years back with the following words. God answers prayers in three ways. Yes, my child, that is what I will give. Yes, my child, but just wait a little. Oh, my child, I have something so much better for you. See, when we approach God knowing that his answer will be one of the above, it gives us such a confidence and eagerness to come to his presence in his throne. It helps us to wait in expectancy because we know God is good and that his delays are not denials. Well, a beautiful example of waiting in expectancy is Anna in the temple, and her story is found in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 and 38. So if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles or on your device, we're going to read that together. It's just a few short verses, but it really shows how we can wait well. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking to Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Now, Anna became a widow after only seven years of marriage. We can read between the lines and know that she was young. We see that no children were mentioned, which means that after her husband died, she would have been very much alone. I'm sure Anna grieved. I know she grieved. But she also didn't let her losses consume her. But rather, she went to the temple, into God's presence. 
Her role at the temple was that of a prophetess, which means that she was a spokesperson for God. She wasn't afraid to declare the word of the Lord. Anna was very old and had been waiting and praying for a very long time, a lifetime. At this point, she had surpassed the life expectancy of her day. She was reaching the end of her human limits here on earth and just waiting to see the promise come to fruition. But this is precisely when Christ shows up, literally as a baby. It is most often when we have reached the end of our physical resources and strength that God steps in. Anna had waited in expectancy for God to answer her prayers. God used her prayers of intercession to usher in the arrival of Christ. God chose her to be an intercessor for Jesus' arrival. Her reward was to meet Jesus and announce his arrival to everyone who is in the temple. Think about that one thing that you are waiting for. Are you more focused on the gift or the giver? Are you waiting and expecting something specific? Or are you expecting and waiting in expectancy for what God wants to do? Expectancy hopes. It has faith that good things will come, but it surrenders to the how it will happen. Ultimately, you have to ask yourself the question, do I trust in God's goodness? Am I willing to let control, go of the control of the answer and the outcome, and even the method of my wait? Psalm 5.3 says, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay down my request to you and wait expectantly. As we wait in expectancy, we must believe that it is not a matter of if God's goodness will come through, but rather when. Well, the second way we can wait well is to trust that God is at work even when we can't see it. When you are in the middle of a really hard wait, this can be life-giving. Sometimes in our waits, we can feel like the silence of unanswered prayers means God must be asleep. We feel that if we can't see what God is doing, then he's not doing anything at all. But in Psalm 124:4, it says, we serve a God who neither slumbers nor sleeps, who promises to never leave us nor forsake us. Would you turn now in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37? And we're going to camp out here for a bit. We're going to look at the story of Joseph. Now, this is a very familiar story, um, but maybe you're not familiar with it. So we're just going to give you a bit of the backstory. It'll be helpful later for you. And we're going to flip through and, and jump some chapters here in Genesis. Joseph is the Bible's poster child for waiting. He's born into privilege. He's handsome, strong, the favorite son of Jacob. Well, one day, Jacob presents his favorite 17-year-old son with this one-of-a-kind coat. Well, soon after receiving the gift, Joseph has two incredible dreams of how one day he would have a place of prominence over his brothers, and they would all bow before him. Now, Joseph's brothers already couldn't stand him. There's actually a verse in Genesis that says he used to go and tattletale on his brothers to his dad, like he was that kid. And so you have to picture him, like he's in his like, fancy coat, and he thinks he's all that. So when he actually shares these dreams, that's like a tipping point for his brothers. So they hatch a plan to get rid of him. The plan's pretty basic. Throw Joseph into a pit and let him starve to death. Well, then the brothers see this trading caravan come up over the horizon, and they say to one another, let's pull Joseph up from the pit, because after all, starvation would be a horrible way to go. And uh, we can make some money on the side. So that's exactly what they do. Joseph arrives in Egypt as a foreign slave with no rights facing a very uncertain future. He is far away from home and even further from the dreams that God had given him. Well, let's go over it. We're going to pick up the story again of Joseph waiting well in Genesis 39, verses 2 to 4. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of the entire household and everything that he owned. Well, how do we know Joseph was waiting well? 
because we don't read about him being bitter or angry at his family for mistreating him, or complaining about how terrible his present circumstances as a slave are. There's no moping around or blaming God. Nope, Joseph worked hard, and God blesses him. Now, everything's going great for Joseph until one day, Potiphar's wife decides she wants the one thing that she just can't have, Joseph. He refuses her day in and day out. Joseph did the right thing, but based on false accusations and lies, he finds himself in prison. He is punished for doing the right thing. When we do the right thing, the hard thing, we may expect that God will protect us and bless us and maybe even reward us, but sometimes life is unfair. When we are waiting, we have to be willing to release the immediate need for answers and for outcomes. Just like Joseph, who didn't fully understand the why, but he was faithful where he was, we also need to serve God faithfully where we are in our wait too. We often think of serving as doing, but sometimes we serve God best by just being in his presence like Anna was in the temple. Now, as Joseph finds himself thrown into prison, I wonder if he thought back to the dreams from a few years previous and wished he had never shared them with his brothers. Maybe part of God's waiting room for Joseph was starting to replace the pride in his heart with some humility. See, God allowing Joseph to be put into prison was not a punishment, but rather to position him for God's greater plan. Your weight is not a punishment from God. Do not let the enemy sneak in and convince you that you are being punished or that God doesn't love you. See, even in prison, God was at work. We're going to read the following from Genesis 39, 21 to 23. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite. There's that word again, but in a different context. He was a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with Joseph and caused everything he did to succeed. We see again God's favor on Joseph's life and the love that he had towards Joseph. That really caught my attention when I was studying this passage, that it actually says God showed his faithful love to Joseph in prison. But do you know what we don't see here? Is God releasing Joseph from prison. Joseph is still waiting. If your weight feels like a prison this morning, ask God to reveal his love to you, that he would sustain you just the way he did for Joseph. Well, after Joseph has been in prison for some time, two prisoners, Pharaoh's baker and the cupbearer, have a set of dreams. And Joseph says, my God can interpret those for you. And then he says the following to the cupbearer in Genesis chapter 40, verses 14 and 15. And please remember me and do me a favor when things are going well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so that he might let me out of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I am here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. Here we see Joseph trying to speed up the process of his wait. Have you ever tried to expedite your waiting season by manipulating your circumstances? I know I have. Joseph correctly interprets the dreams. Side note, this is the first time the Holy Spirit comes on someone in the Bible, and it's during a wait season. Well, unfortunately, the chief cupbearer is so excited to be free, he forgets about Joseph. I'm sure at this point, Joseph is sitting in prison wondering, God, why did you even let me interpret those dreams if you had no intention of getting me out of here? Have you ever caught yourself thinking similar things in your wait times? Questioning God's timing or his methods? I think it's because we start to doubt God's goodness and loving character in our waiting seasons. If we focus on just getting out of our situation, we will miss out on what God is trying to do through our situation. We can be so preoccupied with what we think God should be doing that we actually are unable to receive and enjoy what he is actually doing. Well, let's jump ahead to Genesis chapter 41, verse 1, and it says, Two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. 
Joseph, after having his hopes raised, after successfully interpreting the cupbearer's dream, was left in captivity for two more years. That is 730 more days of waiting. Now, Pharaoh has these dreams, but of course, no one can interpret them in the whole kingdom. The cupbearer all of a sudden remembers there's this guy in prison who actually interprets dreams. What was his name? Right, Joseph. So if you've ever wondered from this story why it was a cupbearer who lived and not the baker, it's because the cupbearer's job was to be positioned right beside Pharaoh in his court. God had not forgotten about Joseph during those two years, but rather he was working all things together for that moment when Pharaoh would have a dream. God was at work even when Joseph couldn't see it. Now Joseph is called before Pharaoh and says, well, I can't interpret your dreams, but my God, he can. Joseph hears the dreams and gives a successful interpretation. Well, chapter 41, verse 41 is going to bring us full circle. Pharaoh says to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Well, sometime later, there is a famine in all of Egypt and surrounding nations. Jacob sends his sons to Egypt to buy food. The brothers find themselves bowing before Joseph in Pharaoh's court, only they have no idea that it's their brother. Joseph's dream he had had 13 years earlier has finally come to pass after a very long wait. Joseph never lost sight of the fact that God was sovereign, that God was in full control of his situation and the outcome. Joseph says in Genesis 45, verse 5, the following words to his brothers. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. It was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace, and the governor of all of Egypt. He also says in Genesis 50, 20, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. Joseph had this beautiful coat of many colors that was stolen from him, but it was replaced and restored with fine Egyptian linen clothing, a gold chain, and the very signet ring off of Pharaoh's own hand. God used the challenging times that Joseph faced to develop his character and his competency to handle the call of being promoted to second in command in all of Egypt. Joseph went from managing a household to a prison to a kingdom. What if you looked at your current weight through that lens? That God is developing your character and your competency to prepare you for what he is calling you to next. There is also a verse that demonstrates the spiritual growth of Joseph in all of these trials. Pharaoh says the following to his advisors in Genesis 41, 38. Can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Can you imagine if after your wait that you're in right now, others noticed the first thing that they noticed about you was that you were filled with God's spirit? There is no way Joseph could have thought up the plan that unfolded with Pharaoh to not just save his family of 75 individuals, but a nation and surrounding nations from starvation and death. Joseph's plan was short-sighted. He just wanted to get out of prison. If God had let him out two years earlier when the cupbearer was freed, he would have been um, interpreted the cupbearer's dream and perhaps been released back into a life of being a servant in Pharaoh's court. But see, God's plan included not just freedom from prison, but a promotion and authority over all of Egypt. Only God could have done that. Joseph's circle of influence was increased, his position and authority were increased, and his access to resources were increased because he waited well. And don't miss what the enemy meant for evil. His brother's original plan was to leave Joseph to starve to death in a pit. God's plan was for Joseph to prevent mass starvation and death on a national scale. That is the God we serve Isaiah 64, 4 says, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait on him. 
What God is doing in your weight is much bigger than just you. He is not limited by your limitations. Don't miss the opportunity to partner with God in your weight and watch him do abundantly more than you could ever ask or imagine. Well, the third way we can wait well is with a heart of gratitude. Now, we've seen two examples of waiting well, but I believe we can learn just as much from an example of what not to do in our weight. The Israelites did a lot of waiting, and they were rarely grateful. The Bible records 15 different occasions where the people complained, murmured, or grumbled. They complained about the type of food, the lack of water, their leaders, that entering the promised land was just too hard. They continually focused on what they didn't have, rather than opening their eyes to see what God was providing. Exodus 16.2 says, the whole community complained about Moses and Aaron. If the Lord had only killed us back in Egypt, they moaned, but now you've brought us into the wilderness to starve us all to death. And then we read what God actually did in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. For the Lord your God has blessed you in everything you have done. He has watched over your every step through this great wilderness. During these 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. God remained faithful even when his people were faithless in their weight. How often do we miss God's provision because it looks different than what we expected? God's blessing is all around us. We just need to stop fighting our weight and ask God to open our spiritual eyes to see our many blessings. The Israelites lacked nothing except for the very thing that would have carried them through their weight well, gratitude. In the Bible, there are some things we are called to do continually, and they are found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. This is the definitive list for waiting well. Being grateful in our prayers leads to rejoicing. And what does Philippians 4.4 4 say? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. This verse actually means that we praise God before he provides, during the provision, and we remember his provision in our wait. And we thank him always. We praise him in all circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ones we just don't understand because of who he is, not because of what he can do. We remember that we seek the giver, not the gift. Scientific research shows, I read some books on like neurology and stuff this summer just for fun, and it shows that there's actually studies I had to do a deep dive, because you guys heard this, there is this um, thing going around that anxiety and gratitude cannot coexist in your brain. So I'm like, is that for real? So I actually read a Carolyn Leaf book on neuroscience. It's true. It's like so cool. So anyway, it's an either-or situation. You can feel anxious and negative feelings, or you can feel grateful and all the positive emotions associated with it. The two cannot coexist together in your brain, proven by very smart people. So remember that one. <laughs> so, how we wait with a heart of gratitude instead of grumbling. Well, one simple step would be to start a gratitude journal, or start a new folder on your phone, a voice memo file if you're not a writer. But here's the thing. You want to have three things that you're looking forward to each day, and then three things that you were thankful for. At night, finish by reflecting on your day and writing out three positive things that happened or three ways you saw God working. Small blessings are just as important as the big ones. Looking for blessings and recording them is important because the enemy wants you to forget how good God is. Cultivating a practice of gratitude gets our eyes off of our circumstances and back onto God where they belong. Now, as you begin to pause and look for God's blessings and provision in your weight, you can also shift your outlook to add the word yet to your weight. I haven't been healed yet. My child hasn't turned back to God yet. I'm not out of debt yet. My marriage has not been restored yet. 
yet is a powerful word because it makes room for hope, and more importantly, it makes room for God. Now, the longer you wait, the more God can do. This is a line from a Phil Wickham song, and it was such a revelation for me. Listen to worship music when I'm walking the dog, and I heard this line, and it really hit me that whatever you are waiting for, either God is still working on it, or God is working on you. God often does something in us before he does something for us. And so when you're doubting in your wait, just remind yourself, the longer I wait, the more you can do. And make that like this declaration that you're like, the enemy is not winning today. The longer I wait, the more you can do. It's powerful, it has been so useful to me, so I encourage you to do that. Now you can also see your um, current circumstances and opportunities, um, and even the setbacks that you're facing, through the following filter. How will I use this time in my wait to become more like Jesus? How can this wait allow me to love God more and receive his love more? And how can God use my life to glorify him, even now, as I wait? Now, I by no means have this wait thing figured out, but I have learned a few things in my current wait this past two years. I have learned that waiting on God is not a passive thing, but actually very active. The things that might look different but they are still so very good. I remember at the end of December in 2023, as I reflected on the past year, I was feeling like my time of waiting had been wasted. I wasn't able to do all the things I had done before. I didn't have a long list of goals and accomplishments to check off at the end of 2023. And I was feeling particularly discouraged. And then this text came through from our daughter. You really killed the Apple Music this year, Mom. And I was like, what now? <laughs> I didn't know it was a thing. I know, I'm getting old. Anyway, she shared this screenshot with me, and Andy's going to put it up, and two things jumped out at me. The first was, defined your year. The second thing was that number one and two were music that I used during my prayer time. Those minutes that you see up there adds up to 774 hours of prayer. I'm not telling you that because I am like, I did 70. I'm telling you that because God is at work even when we don't see it. I'm telling you that because in December of 2023, when I felt like I had a year wasted, that I had done nothing, I had accomplished nothing for God. God just brought me, humbled me through my daughter, showing this to me, where she was like, kind of thought it was funny. It, it stopped me in my tracks. Defined your year. Deb, this is what defined your year, not what you did. I couldn't do much, but I could pray. <laughs> I, didn't know how many, I didn't know how much time. If you had asked me, I had no idea. God gives us gifts along the way of our weight to sustain us, to strengthen us, and to encourage us. And this was my gift from him in my weight. Second thing. I started a gratitude journal. I started it January 1st of this year, and I can tell you already, as I'm looking back through the pages, I am amazed to see how many blessings God has given me through my weight. And one last example that I felt challenged by God to say yes to things that scare me and take me out of my comfort zone. I felt God challenged me. He said, I felt like he was saying to me, Deb, you say yes to the things you can do in your own strength. But you don't ever do things that scare you or stretch you, so I don't need to show up. So one of my yeses that happened this spring was I said yes to teaching a four-week series to 60 junior highs here on Tuesday nights. That experience increased my faith and trust that God really does show up when we feel out of our depth and that my physical limitations do not limit God. We can use our times of waiting to develop new skills, try new things, go new places, meet new people, and grow closer to God. We can pray that God would open our eyes to the many blessings that he is giving us, even if it looks different than what we were praying for. 
Your weight is not wasted if you come to a place of surrender and admit, submit to God's plans and purposes for your life. Your weight is not wasted if you deepen your faith walk and learn new things about yourself and God. Your weight is not wasted if you spend more time in God's word and in prayer. And your weight is not wasted because God is in the business of restoring. The truth is, you are never going to miss out on anything you should have by waiting on God. What are you waiting for today? What in this moment do you feel would be absolutely impossible without God's intervention? What is that one thing that you think of and you know that it would take an absolute miracle for it to happen? What would happen if you chose today to say, Father God, I know you love me, you want what's best for me, and I want your will, your way. God, I don't want to waste this weight. I want to be open to you transforming me into more of who you want me to be. Now, if you want to surrender your current weight to God, I'm going to ask that where you're sitting right now, you're going to hold your hands out in front of you. And this is going to symbolize that you are handing your expectations and your timing of your weight over to God. Just give it over to him and say, I trust you with my weight. And then, as an act of expectancy, that you want to receive whatever God has for you in your weight, I want you to keep them open before God. And I'm going to pray for us. God, would you help me to trust you that if you are allowing my current circumstances, it is with plan and purpose, and that nothing is wasted in your plans and purposes. Help me to wait in expectancy of what you're going to do and be confident that it's going to be more than I could ever ask or imagine. This morning, as I've laid down everything I've been holding on to too tightly in my weight, I ask that you would open my heart and my hands up to develop a heart of gratitude that you would open my eyes to see all the blessings that you have given me, that you would give me faith to trust that even when I can't see you working on my behalf, that I know you are working all things out for my good and for your glory, because only you can make a way where there seems to be no way. Amen.